Hey, everybody. I just wanted to welcome you to the new channel. Thank you for coming. Thank you for subbing. And if you haven't subbed, please do so. I'm trying to build this channel. I have a second. This is my second channel. First one is Richard Contramundum. Uh, that's kind of more cultural, kind of bite-sized stuff. This is uh, longer form, hour, hour and a half conversations that is going to be separate. I have some of those old conversations um, on the prior channel, and those will eventually populate on this channel too, but I'm also doing new conversations. So today's conversation is uh, a talk with Tom Askell, Dr. Tom Askell. He is the president of Founders, and he's a local pastor, and he ran for SBC president in June of 2022. And so it's a good conversation. I've got a lot of different things. We touch on a lot of stuff, rapid fire questions, um, dwell on some other questions of false teaching, uh, the SBC, what the reason is the SBC, should we even still participate, uh, the whole purpose of the institution that is the SBC, and uh, what we can do about it if we're going to stay in the SBC to uh, fight and you know, what all that looks like. So I hope you find this conversation well. Uh, go ahead and drop a comment and say hi. Uh, if you have other questions you want to be asked, either of me or Tom, feel free to put those in the conversation or the um, description, the comments. And um, please share this too, as I think these are vital things that need to be talked about. All right, enjoy the conversation. Morning, everybody. Welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry, and uh, I've got a returning guest today, Dr. Tom Askell. He is the president of Founders Ministry. He's a pastor down in Florida of Grace Baptist Church. He's a husband and a father, a grandfather. Uh, welcome to the show, Tom. How are you doing today? Doing great, Richard. Thanks for uh, having me back on. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for accepting the invitation. It's always always wonderful. I love talking to different folks and talking about things that matter. I mean, that's really what we're doing here, uh, talking about things that matter. And um, yeah, we'll just get right into it. I, I think many people know who you are, uh, but if not, you you are president of Founders Ministry. It's Ministry of Southern Baptists, um, going back to the heritage of the of the founding fathers of the institutions, basically. You could probably tell it better than me. Uh, you're a, a local pastor, been there for, is it 35 years, 36 years, something like that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, husband, father, like I said. So um, we'll get into it right now. Okay. There's some questions we that have come across both my desk that people have asked me um, personally, and then also as of you, like, well, what about somebody like a Tom Askell, you know, fill in the blank. So a lot of these questions uh, are going to be that. Um, we met face-to-face -face at the convention in Anaheim back in June, which was great. Uh, the total messengers, though, was well under 10,000, but that's pretty big for a West Coast convention, one right. of the biggest in two decades. So I think that shows something, and I think you and I both agree on that, that people are concerned. Uh, however, there's still millions of people in the denomination. It's like, what is it, 12 million, 13 million, 14 million? Yeah. Uh, something like that. So there seems to be a disconnect between the higher ups, the seminaries, the colleges, the institutions, uh, ERLC, and uh, NAM and things like that between those in the pew. Uh, so not everybody listening really kind of knows how the SBC works. Can you just kind of give a few minutes of just, you've been around for a long, long time and seeing the ups and downs in the SBC and just really seasoned in that way. Can you just kind of explain how the SBC is different maybe from uh, the Roman Catholic church or something like that and really how it functions and what does the SBC have over a local church, if any power? Yeah. Well, yeah, the SBC is an association of autonomous, independent churches. And so sometimes um, you might run across uh, members of an independent Baptist church and they put that in their name and they would say, well, we're not Southern Baptist, we're independent and we, you know, we are autonomous. Every Southern Baptist church is just as independent and autonomous as any other local independent autonomous church of any stripe. Um, a lot of churches don't think of themselves that way in the SBC, but that is fundamentally true. It goes to the very heart of what it means to be a Baptist. So this association known as the SBC is a voluntary association. Churches choose to participate in it 
and their standards, obviously, we, we have uh, some financial standards, though that is very low. That was uh, that threshold for financial commitment to be in the SBC was reduced significantly um, 10 or 11 years ago. From the beginning, 1845, you had to contribute at least $250 a year. And then that changed about 11 years ago. So now there's not a minimum. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, so I think you can give a nickel a year. Oh, and, wow. I thought it was still in the 250. Okay, cool. Uh, you know. I, I, that uh, caught me off guard too, but I doubled a few years ago. But uh, every church gets two messengers that it can send to the annual convention as long as it's in friendly cooperation with the SBC. And so you have to believe uh, within the boundaries of the Baptist faith and message. And then there are some things that have been highlighted specifically that over the last several years have, have risen into uh, importance in the convention as the culture has become more and more uh, anti-Christ. So you can't be affirming of homosexuality, LGBTQ types of lifestyles as Christian. Uh, you can't be involved in or affirming any kind of racism specifically as well. And so churches have been removed from the convention by that they're, they're not granted messengers. Their messengers would not be seated as messengers where they to show up at an annual meeting. So that's what that means. So just as local churches are autonomous, so also is the Southern Baptist Convention autonomous. It has the right to determine which churches are in friendly cooperation and which churches are not. We have a credentials committee that functions as the uh, primary tool whereby that question is considered. And the credentials committee can recommend to the convention these churches are no longer friendly cooperation because they practice racism or because they uh, welcome homosexuality as a, a lifestyle that is Christian uh, or they uh, deny the inerrancy of scripture, deny the Trinity of God or any number of things that, that could be brought to the convention as uh, being um, putting a church outside the boundaries of our autonomous association. Now, the SBC is the national organization. There are state organizations as well. I forget how many. Not every state in the union has one. Some states double up, but I think every region in the United States is covered by those state conventions. So Florida has a convention, Texas has a convention, Georgia has a convention, and then you have the Northwest Convention that entails several states up in the Pacific Northwest area. Those state conventions are likewise autonomous but they are comprised of cooperating Southern Baptist churches. So I don't think that, uh, I'm, you know, I'm subject to be corrected on this, but I don't think you can be a member of a, a state convention without affiliating with the National Southern Baptist Convention. And then local associates, well, you might be able to actually because state conventions are autonomous. So they could do that. It'd be weird. I'm not sure. I'm not aware of any situation like that. Right. And then associations as well are autonomous and those are more regionally based associations of uh, Baptist churches. Yeah. So it's possible to be a member of an association without being a member of the SBC. I know it's possible to be a member of the national SBC without being a member of a state convention or a, a local association. Typically those are called at large churches on the state and uh, national level. And, and you're right about what happened out in Anaheim in our annual meeting. We, we have these meetings obviously every year in June they move around to different locations, trying to make it more convenient for churches in different regions of the U.S. to send messengers. The West Coast, obviously, is very inconvenient for mm -hmm. the majority of Southern Baptist Church. It's very expensive this year to drive in or fly into California to spend a few days in California. Everything uh, was incredibly expensive out there for a multitude of reasons in our economy and uh, what's going on in our nation. But we had, I think it was 8,500 or somewhere in that ballpark, messengers that showed up. Mm -hmm. There were 3,500 churches that sent messengers. The SBC has over 47,000 churches. Every one of those churches is eligible to send two messengers. And yet you can tell we, we rarely have more than eight and a half, nine percent of our churches that send any messengers. And the, the people who show up at the annual meetings decide the direction of the convention. Uh, so theoretically, the convention can go only where the churches tell it to go or are willing to allow it to go. But, but here's what happens. We have these entities, we have uh, several of them, 
six seminaries, North American Mission Board, International Mission Board, uh, the uh, Christian, uh, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. Uh, th those are the main entities that these cooperating autonomous Southern Baptist churches give money to help support. And uh, we unite together around missions and, and these other causes of theological education and uh, cultural concerns, political concerns. Well, those entities, every one of them, each here send people to the convention to represent the entities. And when you walk through the exhibit area of the annual meetings, you see these massive displays, massive setups of uh, uh, the seminaries and those <clears throat> entities. And they always have their personnel there to greet people, to instruct them. And, you know, praise God for that. I guide Stone, uh, the um, kind of annuity program for the SBC healthcare program. They always have representatives there. They do tests for free screenings and things. And it's a wonderful thing. But I don't know how many thousands of people come to the SBC each year on the dime of our institutions and entities, but it's a lot. And those very often, because they're coming, they're members of local Southern Baptist churches, will come as messengers from their churches. And so here's what happens is we have Southern Baptist churches, 47,000 Southern Baptist churches paying for messengers from entities and institutions to go to the annual meeting every year. And it's not far-fetched to recognize that those whose salaries are being paid by the institutions and organizations are going to take stands and vote for positions and directions that protect and preserve the institutions and agencies. And the Washington Post said, Two years ago, after the Nashville Convention, they wrote an article in which their reporter said the North American Mission Board had flown in all kinds of church planters that were under their care and their help and direction, instructing them to vote for Ed Litton as president. So if that's true, and now the North American Mission Board, one of their vice presidents said it wasn't true, I encourage them to contact the reporter and ask him to uh, renounce the statement or you know, repudiate it. Uh, he didn't do that, to my knowledge. I did contact the reporter and I said, hey, you know, you've been accused of, of saying this isn't true mm -hmm. and he wouldn't withdraw his story or make any corrective statement. So if that's true, what that means is that churches like ours that did not want Ed Litton to be president paid the salary of people and paid for people's expense to come to Nashville to vote against the wishes of our churches. And Autonomous, local, independent Southern Baptist churches need to wake up and see what's happening on that score. Because mm. whoever shows up at the convention determines which direction the convention goes. Our polity is such that in one sense, it's very cumbersome, but in another sense, it's ingenious. Because if you want to change the direction of the convention, which many of us, thousands of us, were trying to do in Anaheim and Nashville before, it can be done, humanly speaking, it can be done by showing up. All you have to do is send enough messengers that agree with that commitment and vote to change the direction. Uh, but if churches are not willing, not able to send messengers to an annual meeting to vote to do that, then it's largely going to be left in the hands of those who are committed enough to send messengers and those who go on the cooperative program dime as uh, employees and representatives of the institutions and agencies. So uh, the, it's a pretty simple fix if you're concerned about the direction of the SBC, which I am and many others are. It's send messengers, show up, vote to change. And, and let me just mention one other thing real quickly, Richard, because churches I, I've had, I don't know, since Anaheim, dozens, dozens of churches and pastors contact me and said, we're gone. We, we voted to leave the convention. We're just fed up with the way messengers were treated mm -hmm. the last years and what's happening and, you know, all kind of legitimate reasons. I can't argue with them for their reasons. <clears throat> and uh, other churches are ready to leave too. And they said, what can we do? What can we do? You know, we don't want to be paying the way for people to go and vote against the very things that we want to see change or, or that we want to see happen. And, and here's what I've proposed to every autonomous, independent Southern Baptist church. Before you pull out, why not take some of the money that you have been giving that's been misused in your own judgment on education, set it aside to pay the way for messengers from your church to go and vote to change the direction. 
I mean, you're already paying for messengers to go to vote mm. through institutions and agencies. Why not do it more directly? Send messengers who will vote the will of the church that you're a part of. And uh, that can be done. I don't think that that's not illegitimate at all. Anybody who cries foul to that is uh, needs to go back and take a course on Baptist polity and what the nature of autonomy and independence is for every Southern Baptist church. Wow. Um, that's very revealing. <laughs> I think most people, I mean, I knew that more or less, uh, myself, but I want to say that I keep up and try and pay attention, uh, more so probably than the average person. I don't say that, you know, to brag or something, but, um, yeah, I don't think most people realize that because, you know, if you're being sent by NAM, like you said, or the ERLC, well, there was a m measure and I think it wasn't the first time to defund the ERLC, right? Because they're increasingly wishy-washy and squishy and, you know, whatever on a number of things that, you know, why are we, why do we do this again? Why, why are you not really supporting the values? You're not supporting, you're not appealing to scripture. You're doing this and that. And those who were there on the ERLC's dime, <laughs> of course, are not going to vote for that. Not to mention all the other people are like, well, I think it's pretty good. We should have this. And I thought Richard Land and Russell Moore were decent guys, you know, because they're operating on something from 10 or 15, 20 years ago. Right. And now it's like, well, but what's happening now? You know, who is who is I can't remember his name, uh, the, the interim president guy. And He's it's like president, by the way, uh, Brent Leatherwood, I think it is. Is he the president now? Yeah, I think as of yesterday. OK, Um, I guess. Well, I mean, we'll get to it because we've got a, quite a few questions, but what is it that we can, besides going to the convention, because um, I hear people, like you said, we're done, we're leaving, we're out. Uh, other people I've talked to, some other podcasters and things, it's dead, we're done. And we had an opportunity in Nashville, conservatives had the opportunity, we lost it, it's gone. Mm -hmm. I personally don't believe that. Uh, obviously you don't personally believe that either because you guys are still in the SBC, still seeking to proclaim the truth and uh, for the glory of Christ and so on. But like, is it lost or are we just, are we just kind of like, you know, propping around this, this, you know, weekend at Bernie's popped into my head, <laughs> you know, the dead guy and pretending like it's alive and Hey, no, we really like these things or is it still fighting? And, and if so, besides going to the convention, which we should do, what else can we do? What else can the, the small 50 person Southern Baptist church do? Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, I hear that a lot from friends outside the convention, those who have left who uh, want to persuade me and say, why are you still affiliating with the SBC? And some would even charge me with being um, simplistic, naive, or even immoral, you know, sinful and in, in doing so, come ye out from among them type of thing. I think that's a wrong way to think about the SBC. I mean, I, the, the SBC is a voluntary association. It's, it's, I think the best way to be SBC is to recognize that the SBC shouldn't be the most important thing about a local church. I, many of our members, I think all of them, when they come into membership, we explained, yeah, we, we affiliate with the SBC, but nobody in our congregation would uh, put that number one if somebody were to ask, you know, tell us about your church. You know, what, what, what's, what are some things about your church? Uh, being affiliated with the SBC would be lay, low down the list. And I think that's appropriate because the SBC is all about churches. <laughs> and so if your church is all about the SBC, you've got the cart pulling the horse. So because of that, I don't tend to think in terms of, oh, well, it's dead, you know, or, oh, well, it's alive. You know, I think it can be healthier or unhealthier. And I, right now, I think we're on a trajectory toward unhealth in many respects. Uh, prior to maybe the last seven, eight years, uh, I was very hopeful. I, I thought we were on a good trajectory. I mean, I, I was alive and, and a pastor in 1979. So I remember those days. I remember liberal professors that would take one, one guy at Southern Seminary, Professor Theology, would take the Bible and throw it in the garbage uh, every semester when he began to teach on biblical authority. Uh, that, was this, that was his opening statement. Well, we don't have that going on today. Praise God. But the reason we don't have that going on is because there were churches that were willing to send messengers to the annual meeting and they had to do it for like 10 or 12 years in order to affect the kind of change that needed to happen. So 
over the, the course of 79 till up until recently, you know, my argument for people uh, and staying in the SBC and even coming into the SBC is, hey, man, we got a good trajectory. We believe the Bible. You know, our, our churches are taking seriously this. You can't find anybody in any level of SBC life that denies the inerrancy of Scripture. And that's a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. That's a foundation for cooperation. Well, today, I think that's still largely true. You can't find anybody who denies inerrancy. But uh, as has always been the case, inerrancy has never been enough. It's, it's good, but it is not enough. And so now you've got people who sign all the documents and they're saying, oh, yeah, we're inerrantists. You know, we're complementarians and uh, we are straight on biblical sexuality. But then they go on and they will endorse or affirm things like women preachers and like the Revoice Conference. And I mean, we, we got people paid. Uh, staff members that do exactly that uh, in our uh, various levels of Southern Baptist life today. So our trajectory is really bad right now in my mind, but there's still some good things going on. We still have good godly missionaries. You know, we still have some good godly church planners. We still have good godly uh, professors at seminaries. And uh, they're, they're, it, so there's, it's not like, oh, the whole thing is now just completely dead. That's not true. Uh, my concern and my desire is to see the good godly elements uh, protected, strengthened, and uh, re recovered where they've been diminished, and the less godly, ungodly in some ways, elements removed. I, I don't say that with any acrimony or animosity. I just don't think two can walk together unless they're agreed, and I don't agree with some of those, like uh, Karen Swallow Pryor at Southwest, uh, Southeastern Seminary, who has endorsed Revoice, the Revoice Conference. I, I think that's an atrocity and that Southern Baptist shouldn't be paying her salary. I've told Danny Aiken, the president of the seminary, that. I've told her that. Um, and anybody who'll listen, I'll tell that. That's just one example. So what can churches do? The most important thing is bite the bullet, show up, and vote. Mm -hmm. During the conservative resurgence in 79 till you know, the 90s, mid-90s, uh, there were people who drove all night and all day to get to conventions, slept in their cars, ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in order to vote for the president. Mm. That is the key. If we're gonna change the direction of the SBC, messengers have to show up and vote for a man to be president who has enough backbone to stand up against this uh, movement that is taking us right down the same pathway of the, the cultural nihilism that we're living through and say no. We're not going to do that. We're people of the book, and we're going to take our stand here, uh, leave consequences to God, whatever the costs may be. That can happen. It cannot happen apart from showing up. So that's a simple message. But I mean, certainly we ought to be praying. Um, good night. You know, we have a God who raises the dead. So if we're not praying, and that's and uh, that's why you know I'm not I'm not despondent about the SBC. I'm disappointed, saddened by it, uh, but. God has changed it before. He can change it before. And if all the good churches leave the SBC tomorrow, it's not going to come to a close. It's not going to shut down. It will right. down a pathway even faster, and it will become more and more in the hands of leftists and those who will wreak havoc and destruction and do so on the, uh, the large S of faithful men and women in churches who for generations have poured billions of dollars into uh, this missionary enterprise. And I, I hate the thought of that happening, but yeah. it's happening for um, PC USA. If you want a little case study on what the SBC will become, if all the good churches leave, look at the PC USA over the last 120 years. Right. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that is so true. <laughs> so incredibly true. I think a lot of people don't see the other side of it. I mean, I, cause I get it. It's like, well, I mean, I, one of my former pastors from California, he's here in Kentucky now pastoring a church and he took over a church plant that was SBC is maybe an eight year old church plant. And they've since changed their name and, and, and moved buildings and things. So they're not really affiliated much. And they actually removed and left the SBC right around uh, resolution nine. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he said, I don't know how big the church is, maybe 100, 200, something like that. But it was like people have called the church. Hey, are you a Southern Baptist church? Uh, yeah, we are. Oh, OK. You know, and like and so, you know, but then there's the positive of, hey, you're a faithful church. 
well, the Southern Baptist still has a lot of great this and that. And, you know, depending on the person, uh, it could be a pro or a con. I guess it kind of just depends on the, the person in the yeah. church. But situation. That's why you know, I had one friend uh, recently. So I know you're going to be disappointed, but our church voted to leave the SBC uh, this week. And I just want to let you know before it went public. And I, you know, he said, I, I hope it doesn't affect our friendship or something like that. And I, I said, no, man, I, look, I get it. I'm, you won't get any condemnation from me. I get it. This is a local church decision. Why should I stand in judgment at all on uh, what an autonomous, independent church of Jesus Christ decided is best for it? I, you know, I, mm -hmm. I wish we had more to stay to fight, but I get it. I'm not going to yeah. anybody. I guess before we get to the next main question, what, why, why should we fight? I guess what, or maybe I know you've already kind of said a lot of that, but uh, what is the point? of the SBC. I know that might sound nihilistic or something, but like, what's the the main focus again, for those who don't know, I think I know, <laughs> but what would you say? This is why the SBC exists. This is the primary number one reason the SBC exists. What's that? Yeah. It's to cooperate in pursuing the mission that every local church has a part in, in ways that are far better than any one local church can do independently. So, for example, we've got the largest missionary sending force in the world. I think it's over 5,000 missionaries across the world. Uh, we do have a, a church planting entity, the North American Mission Board. We educate one-third of all seminary students, all Protestant seminary students in the United States are being educated in Southern Baptist seminaries. That is an outsized influence in our convention. The SBC doesn't have one-third of all Protestant Christians or one-third of the churches in the United States, but we educate one third of all of those who are in seminary for those churches and, and institutions. So I look at that. Well, you know, could Grace Baptist Church here in Cape Coral, Florida, uh, send out 5,000 missionaries? Well, no, we couldn't. You know, could we educate one? Th no, we couldn't. I mean, we just couldn't do it, but we could do it together. Now we can cooperate with other churches that we don't agree with on every little dotted I and cross T. We would have our unique uh, distinctive differences from a lot of churches. And that's been the case from the beginning. Um, so you have to be willing to live with that. And some churches aren't, I get it. You know, they, they want to draw the circle far more narrow. Uh, we have a mindset that, that we can cooperate across some differences for things that we have in common uh, with other Baptist churches, like planning churches and sending missionaries and educating students. So uh, all of those things are legitimate. And, um, uh, all of them are the business of local churches. So this is one of the dangers of denominationalism is denominations tend to take on a bureaucratic mindset that mm -hmm. says, oh, we've got to do this. You know, this Southern Baptist plant churches, Southern Baptist, the, the SBC sends uh, missionaries, the SBC uh, trains students. Well, it's local churches' responsibility to do all of that. And the SBC exists because local churches want to partner together to do more together than what any one of us could do uh, individually. So that's that's the genius of the SBC, but it, it does become uh, a danger if the bureaucratic mindset takes hold. And sadly, uh, that is always crouching at the door, always a temptation. Back during the, the conservative resurgence, Timothy George, friend of mine, retired president of uh, Beeson Divinity School, uh, Timothy said, the exchange of one set of bureaucrats for another doth not a reformation make. And he was prophetic in mm -hmm. his. Yeah, wow. Uh, no, that's good. And I, I think it, kind of the old adage of, you know, many hands makes light work, like you're saying, because even if, you know, the church I pastor and Grace Baptist Church and Tom Buck's church or, you know, and some other people and some friends up here and like, hey, now we've got it together and we're, we'll send, we've got 15 churches that dot these areas and we're going to throw our money into a pot and mm -hmm. we're going to sponsor a couple missionaries in Africa. Or we're going to send it to Vodi over in, uh, uh, in Zambia, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, African Christian University and we're going to support that. Great. But what about all the other areas, <laughs> you know, and we're doing that same thing just on a smaller level. Of course, you know, I can call you or text you, or you can call, call Tom or Vody or whatever. And so there's a much more close knit, which is great. I mean, we see this with the local family, right? The smallest, the smallest, you know, Republican type of uh, government of, well, my wife and I can decide what's for dinner pretty quick. 
Now mm-hmm. people are coming over. Well, we got to do that. Well, other people, it's a church-wide thing. It's bigger. Now it's a community thing, you know, bigger and bigger. So, you know, sometimes bigger is great, but if it gets too big, then it seems to be there's a problem, like you're saying. Um, so that kind of leads into the second question, main question. Anyway, we've had several already, but uh, I was in a conversation I was about a month or so ago. And the guy was one of the guys was in his 30s, graduate of an SBC school, uh, but he's no longer in the SBC. Uh, he's got a podcast and stuff, and he's an author. And, and another guy was in his 60s, and he's in uh, an SBC school college, I think, down in uh, Alabama. And he's still, of course, in the SBC. And the difference the professor was saying between now and then, say in the 70s and the 80s, is people really wanted the SBC. They wanted the institution of the SBC. They were proud to be an SBC. They were, they wouldn't just say Baptist, but Southern Baptist. And you're saying, ah, less so. Uh, and I, I agree as well. I think, I think it's not as big of a deal, but I don't know. I mean, is that why we're not seeing in your estimation, why we're not seeing a push for young and old alike to come together and say, we got to save our beloved SBC. Cause I've heard that out of the mouths of other SBC, including I kind of follow some of the CBN stuff. And I've been to a couple of meetings just trying to see what's going on. And I've heard that said, and I, and, and me as a California Westerner kind of, you know, no denomination in my past and okay, I embrace the SBC now, but loosely, I kind of irk at that, like beloved SBC, like eh, why not for Jesus? Why not for the truth? Why not for like, missions why, why are we saving the sbc just for sbc's sake what are your what are your thoughts kind of explain a little bit more of that i know you've said a lot already so yeah well i do think that there are different mentalities and uh so the the older professor that you mentioned um uh, yeah i mean i get it you know and i had a lot of that growing up i mean I, uh from one of my college roommates gave me a book he was a christian and he said you really like this book i looked at it but i didn't even look at the title of the author i looked at the the publisher and it wasn't convention press. And so I just put it on my shelf. I thought, well, that's probably not that big a deal. You know, well, it wasn't until I got to seminary. I looked at that book again. It was J.I. Packer's Knowing God. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's just a snapshot of my mentality. And I don't think I'm, I'm that unusual for my generation. And so I can understand uh, where this brother's coming from in his thinking. And certainly in 79 and in 80, 81, those early years, uh, churches that were Southern Baptists were alarmed as they began to be informed of a professor throwing a Bible in the garbage every semester and of uh, affirming homosexuality of professors doing that. And, you know, the, the predecessor of the ERLC, the Christian Life Commission, actually wrote position papers affirming abortion. I mean, this, this, we just we were in a bad way and churches weren't paying much attention. You didn't have social media. The news cycle was two or three days. And so it just took a while to figure things out. If you know, if you if you wanted to have a theological debate, you actually had to do it with uh, uh, theological journals, which would come out, you know, the, the most uh, uh, rapidly that they would come out would be monthly. Most of them were quarterly. You know, so you you didn't get the back and fire of 10 different arguments in six hours like you get on Twitter uh, today. So that's the, all of that factors into it. And then you do have the, uh, this new gen- and rising generations and the denominationalism is dead. Uh, I, I genuinely believe that. And I think overall, mm-hmm. the thing, denominations are not dead. Denominations continue to have life. Now, they may have bad life. Let's say PCUSA, United Methodist Church, uh, for example, would be two. They're still denominations. They're still doing things. They're still alive. It's just bad things that that life is uh, facilitating. So the SBC is not going to, quote, die in that sense. But denominationalism is dead. So I get it with older people, particularly, and some of the younger ones who who have uh, been greatly helped by SBC, and some converted on the mission field through Southern Baptist missionaries, some trained in Southern Baptist colleges, Southern Baptist institutions, and uh, various ways. They, they have a loyalty to the SBC as a brand kind of thing. But quite honestly, I don't think that is the healthiest form of loyalty. I do think if we can get to what you asked initially, you know, what, what about what's the purpose of the SBC? What is it that we can do? What is it that we will lose if we don't f- affiliate with the SBC? If we can get that kind of vision in front of churches and younger pastors, especially, look, uh, we have tremendous opportunity. We have a stewardship of what God has entrusted to us. 
uh, throughout generations. That's true for every Christian, every century, uh, because we are all a part of this one stream of those who call Jesus Christ Lord. But then it becomes more narrowly true for Baptists. And so we trace our history, our lineage back to the 17th century and those modern Baptists and the fights they fought and the costs that they paid to be Baptists. You know, we're Protestants, so we're a broader stream. We trace our roots back to the Protestant Reformation. We're Orthodox. I mean, all those different streams. Well, the same thing's true more narrowly for Southern Baptists. You know, we've, we've been around since 1845. Tremendous sacrifice, tremendous sacrifice on the part of our forefathers to hand down to us opportunities to be where we are positioned today to educate one third of the Protestant seminary students in the United States to have the largest missionary sending force in the world. That didn't happen overnight. That didn't happen without sacrifice. And the question that I want to press to people in the SBC is what are we going to do that? What, what, what kind of stewardship are you going to discharge with all that God has entrusted to you through this affiliation? And some might say, as they do, well, look, we're not going to handle it anymore. You know, whether the cost is too high, so we're leaving. I get that. But if you're going to stay in, I don't see how you can stay in and not be willing to fight for what is right and good and true. And by, I use language, the Bible uses the word fight and battle, war. I'm not talking about uh, being filled with animosity. I'm not talking about any kind of uh, personal uh, contention against people. I'm talking about contending for the truth, defending the truth at all costs because we have the God of truth who gave up his son for us and our allegiance is first and foremost to him. So if we're going to stay in, then we ought to be wanting to make it better. If we're not willing to do that and pay the price that cost that it will cost to do that, I don't know why you'd stay in. Mm. No, that's a good point. Yeah, I, I think you mentioned that uh, in Anaheim too. I've heard you say that other times too. It's like, you're here, great, then fight. Now yeah. is the time to fight uh, or leave. Uh, but don't say, and that's the thing that I struggle with, especially where I'm at in Western Kentucky, is just the kind of, well, you know, good old boys type of thing. And it's like, I don't, I don't have any time for that. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm really busy anyway. I don't, I don't have whatever. I'm not trying to whatever, but it, it's just like, uh, no, it's, there aren't, there are issues. Like, what do we do? What do we, anyway, I won't rant on that, but um, I guess then the steering of the ship right obviously you were uh, nominated for president i thought you'd win to be totally honest i guess it was still kind of that erlc and nam and a lot of other people still sending people to anaheim and voting as if they voted in nashville so that to say what what is because i've had this conversation before and i thought this too the cbn okay great cool uh, I like it. It sounds good. You know, there's this and that, and this guy's involved and this guy's involved and there's a steering community and they've got a nice website and they've got events, but, and one of the gentlemen I was talking with about a month or so ago, same thing. He was like, I don't see a lot of strong Adrian Rogers, WA Criswell, Patterson, Pressler, that type of leadership. Do mm -hmm. you see that? And if not, why not? Yeah, well, it's, um, Again, I think some of it goes to the previous question, you know, what, what kind of man is going to give himself to wanting to be a prominent leader in a denomination in a day when denominationalism is dead? Uh, part of my concern is the people who aspire to that, many of them, uh, it's because they have that sense about the denomination, that it's all important or most important or too significant. It's exactly why they should not be <laughs> in that position because that kind of mentality is very, very unhealthy. And so there are lots of faithful pastors, lots of men who are fine, capable, even dynamic leaders in the SBC, but they're not trying to climb any denominational uh, ladder. Now, I'm not suggesting Adrian Rogers, Paige Patterson were. I, you know, that, God knows that. I mean, the, Paige, uh, Adrian Rogers, especially, I, I, I was around him several times, and, and my respect for him grew tremendously, even though he and I disagreed on some key theological points. But he was, from all that I could tell, 
a sincere, godly man of God who feared God and wanted to honor God. And he was pastoring a church, a churches. You know, that was that was what he did. But he, he loved the SBC, he was in the SBC. And with this denominational mindset that was more permeating SBC churches then than it is now, well, I think that there was a, a, a maybe an easier way to be recognized as a leader. And certainly he had all the gifts and grace of God uh, to do that. But we, we have men like that. I think Mike Stone uh, is a man like that. I think Mike would have led the SBC so very well. And yet it was ungodly, sinful, wicked tactics carried out even by people who were leading our so-called Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission that did Mike Stone in. I mean, it was wicked. It is, there's no, there, I'm going to have to be convinced with evidence contrary to the evidence that I know and have seen with my own eyes that what happened to Mike Stone was anything less than godless and wicked. And they did it. They kept him from becoming president. I think he would have been president. I talked to people who uh, didn't vote for him on the first ballot and refused to vote for him on the second ballot because of uh, these accusations that came the last week and even the day before the vote. They just, they just well, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't do it because I was afraid that he's guilty of covering up sex abuse. That's poppycock. That's a lie from the pit of hell. And yet it's a lie that was spread by Russell Moore, who at that time was the president of the Ethics Religious Committee. Mm -hmm. And the commission, and and it was seconded by leaked audio transcripts that proved nothing, but that Philip Bethencourt, his right hand man, said proved that Mike Stone is guilty, and everything Russ Moore said is true. Uh, it's poppycock. It's 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 ludicrous it's a lie. So I think Mike Stone is that kind of man. You know, we have other guys. We have faithful pastors in the SBC that I would follow gladly, and I would be fully confident would lead us in good directions, but you have a machine and you have this regime leadership now that's firmly entrenched that does not want that. They fear that. And so they will tell lies. Uh, they will distort, they will marshal whatever evidence or ever, ever influence they have to keep that from happening. And, uh, you know, and we saw that in Nashville, we saw it in Anaheim and leading up to Anaheim, quite honest. I, you know, I mean, nothing happened to me like what happened to Mike, uh, but there were lies told about me. I, I was told about directors of missions gatherings where uh, things were said about us and our church that were just completely not factual, not true. Wow. Uh, guys saying we can't vote for a man, you know, who, of whom this is true. One former, former associate pastor of mine had, had dinner with a man like that after the vote Tuesday night in Anaheim. And this guy was telling him, I just couldn't vote for Tom Haskell because you know, we were at a meeting and we were told that his church hadn't baptized anybody in 10 years. Wow. But, and on staff, <laughs> he says, that's not true. That's a lie. That's a lie. And the guy felt embarrassed uh, for buying a lie. And, you know, there was that at Anaheim. And anyway, it, but God knows, and, and you know, he raises the dead. So I mean, that's all in his hands. The messengers voted and that's fine. You know, they made their decision. I'm not, not hurt by that at all. But I am saying that we have good, godly men of integrity mm -hmm. could lead us well. They have backbone. And, um, uh, but you know, you, you pay a price if you're, if you put your uh, name out there and you're willing to, to do that, because you just know there are going to be these regime folks that just are going to come against you. They will try to tell lies about you or do whatever they can to keep you from being instrumental in changing the direction because it is in their best interest that the direction not change. Right. No. And th I think that's something that most people, I, I fear, I mean, I don't really pay a lot of attention to politics. I, again, probably somewhat, but the amount of tactics in the regular political Democrat Republican debates, whether it's governor or certainly president. And then I see the same type of behavior in the SBC. I mean, it's, it's, it's disgusting. And it's like you said, it's, you use multiple <laughs> wicked and sinful and, and, and it is. And it's like, did you not read the end of Revelation where it says all liars will have their place in the lake of fire that burns with like, do you, like lying is one of those. I mean, I I despise it personally. Uh, I, I know that kind of sounds silly, but like, it's one of those things that you. It's it's easy. It's harder to not sin in certain areas, 
you know, beautiful lady or this happens or you get angry. Sure. There's certain temptations that, you know, especially as men, we may struggle with more, but lying is one of those things. It's like, it's pretty easy to be like, yeah, I'm at work or I'm not at work or this guy did this or not do that. Or I'm really spending money on this thing or that. Like, it's pretty easy not to lie. At least that's, that's my two cents, but it's, well, it's, it's shameful. It's crazy. It is shameful. And yet, uh, Bart Barber, the president of the SBC appointed an open liar to the implementation task force, you know, to deal with that. I mean, Todd Binkert was caught lying on audio recording and, and then tried to double down on it and, you know, basically wrote it off. So, well, if it would help, would, would help you if I apologize, I'll apologize. He is a liar. He lied about covering up a sex abuse victims, uh, further, uh, traumatizer, somebody who stole her story and publicized her story against her will and her knowledge. Todd Binker covered up for that person or those people, whoever they might be. And when confronted about it, lied about it. And Todd has now been appointed on this sex abuse task force implementation reform uh, mm -hmm. group. So yeah, I, there's no fear of God. I mean, that's the bottom line. No fear of God. If Todd Binker feared God, he wouldn't have responded to lying the way that he did. He wouldn't have lied, number one, but after he was caught lying, there, there would have been some real repentance. There wouldn't have been, would it help if I apologized? I'll apologize. And he certainly wouldn't have been appointed to this task force, which delegitimizes whatever the task force does. Mm -hmm. I have, but it does. I'm sure that will do some good work. But if Todd Binkert is on it, hey, I'm going to wonder. And, and I think with good reason and a lot of other people are too. Yeah, no, I mean, it's definitely, I mean, it's, it's like somebody with their word and they keep saying, I'll do this or this. I'll show up there. Yeah. Let's get coffee. Let's do this. I want to do that. And time and time again, you just stop trusting them because they, they keep saying, sorry, just kidding. And, and yeah, when something's compromised like that, especially with lying, it's, it's very difficult to earn that trust back. Um, yeah, I guess question, a couple more, and we'll wrap up. Um, Grace Baptist Church, Cape Floral, Florida. You've been there a long time. What does the SBC have to do or become for Cape, for sorry, Grace Baptist Church to leave the SBC? Yeah, well, and you know, we don't have any lines in the sand. I guess, I guess we do at some points, but we, we're not facing that right now. Uh, I mean, if the SBC were to take an official stance on something clearly contrary to the Word of God, uh, you know, we're, we're going to we're not going to be a part of any kind of organization that does that. But that's not happened. Our official stances are good. What we're facing right now is people who wink at the official stances or who sign off on the official stances and they do things that are contrary to those positions. And that's, that's where the battle is. That's where we're focused. And if we're going to you know, try to be helpful, that's where, how we're going to try to be helpful. But so if the SBC, like the Rick Warren thing with the women pastors, I, I think that's potential right there. The credentials committee saying we, we really don't know what a pastor or not. Yeah. The credentials committee, we don't know what a pastor is really seriously. So we need to study that. Well, I mean, come on. If that goes South and the SBC takes a formal position saying it is okay for churches to have women pastors, then I don't see mm -hmm. our in. And uh, so that would be one example. And there, there would be others. Um, but I don't think we're, I mean, that's, that's probably the closest thing we have right now to a line in the sand that could be coming up. But otherwise, is if, if we just, we don't have any effort to, uh, to cooperate with churches like ours, if we continue to be marginalized, you know, again, in the, in the uh, conservative resurgence, Richard Jackson had this great line. He, he was talking about the, moderates and liberals he said their their definition of cooperate is you cope while we operate and uh i think we're seeing that again today and, and so you know at some point we think well you know our, our time and energies might be better spent somewhere else but i mean that's not we're not there you know we're not there i mean if the sbc were to do something official that would we, we couldn't be a part of that but we're the sbc doesn't seem to be on the brink of that this this women pastor thing might be that my guess it will come up with some kind of wishy-washy you know no stand type of thing and we'll just have to keep it, continue to bring it up and fight that battle until a stand is taken but um we'll see yeah okay no that's good um 
Lastly, uh, in the spirit of the Apostle Paul and others, uh, when he warned of Demas, where Demas, of course, was an associate, Philemon 124, and then rather leaves and goes to Thessalonica to Timothy 4.9. Uh, he warned of Hymenaeus and Alexander, uh, 1 Timothy 1.20, and rebuked Bar-Jesus, the false prophet, false Jewish prophet to his face in Acts 13.8 and 9. Uh, there is false teaching out there. Um, sometimes it's kind of nebulous. Some people don't really know what to think, or is that really false teaching, or how are we supposed to do that? Uh, do you see false teaching in the SBC seminaries and colleges, especially thinking of those like Jarvis Williams at Southern Seminary or Walter Strickland at Southern uh, or Southeastern? Do you see that? Do you do you categorically say that that's false teaching, or is it still like, well, I don't know, or you know, kind of put you on the spot there? What do you got? Yeah, well, I mean, again, I think both those guys are brothers. I've not met Jarvis. I've met Walter. He seems to be a wonderful, warm-hearted man, and I love, you know, love his spirit that's come through in the, the conversations that we've had. Uh, has he taught some things that might be categorized as false teaching? Teaching, possibly. I mean, I've heard him talk about uh, James Cone, commending James Cone's books and teaching, but I've been told privately that he repudiates James Cone's uh, Black Liberation Theology. So, I mean. So I wouldn't throw a blanket and say, oh, yeah, you know, uh, Walter Strickland's this or he's that. But I do think he's taken some problematic stands. And uh, if you if you need an example of that, just go look up his uh, interview that he gave with The New York Times. What was that, three years ago or something, two years ago? And um, oh, I mean, yeah, it's disastrous. Mm -hmm. Now, he wrote a, a, an explanation article that I find completely unsatisfactory. You know, I think it's one of those massage things, PR things, uh, didn't really deal with the issues and the things that he actually said. He didn't repudiate what he should have repudiated it, that came out in that New York Times article. And so I, I still think there are unanswered questions there. They just kind of said, nothing to see here, you know, move along type of deal. But you do have Karen Swallow Pryor, you know, who endorsed Reboy's teaching at Southeastern Seminary. I have a massive problem with that. I was just told that um, New Orleans Seminary recently, maybe it's already happened, um, had Sam Alberry in to uh, teach along with a, a lady, I forget her name, but she's maybe the head of the Jude 3 project that's had a lot of problems in things they promoted. Come to New Orleans Seminary to lead an apologetics uh, emphasis or seminar or something. Now, again, I don't know any more than just what I've said, because that's what was told to me, but those kind of things are problematic. So it's not like, oh, you know, uh, goodness, you, you, you've got Clark Pinnock over here teaching at a seminary, stay away from the seminary, that's heresy. It's not that black and white, but I think what we do have are people who have either publicly or privately taken positions, endorsed positions that are massively problematic. And then beyond that, you've got more who have just kind of tolerated things that should not be tolerated uh, for the health of the church. J.I. Packer once said that uh, theologians are like the uh, sanitation workers in the church. They're the ones responsible to take the garbage out and to keep it from coming in. And I think that's true. And that how many of our theologians today just kind of want to bury their head in the sand? And just say, you know, well, you know, she signed all the documents and we just all need to get along. Um, I don't I don't think that's the way that we are to be good stewards of the truth of God that's been handed to us. The, the gospel that's come to us with blood stained hands. I think we need to be willing to spill our own blood for the sake of this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the authority and sufficiency of his word. And uh, we still have some people doing that. And praise God for that. But we have a lot of people that just kind of wink at that and want you to believe that they're on that page when in reality how they function the way they're living and what they're tolerating welcoming in platforming is contrary to that gotcha why do you think then personally um because even i mean i have a lot of respect for al moeller um and i'm probably i'm not an unbiased person to evaluate <laughs> personally his stuff and how he's worked over the course of several decades in Southern and just writing and speaking and things. But he said some stuff that's kind of like, and then it kind of goes back. And then it's kind of like this. And then, you know, there's other things that, you know, the Danny Akins and the others that I, I, I want to give these guys benefit of that personally. I, I'm not a guy at all. I don't think people think that either. Of, oh, I want to attack somebody. I'm a young, I want to make a name for myself, blah, blah, blah. No, it's just like, you said you believe this. 
Like mm-hmm. you said, you know, there's a book, believe the book. It's good. I've said that a few times in, <laughs> in conversation and stuff too. And, and it's so true, right? Here it is. This is what it says. Um, but they'll take stands or like you just said, Strickland may preach or talk about um, James Cone, which is, I mean, it's heresy. I mean, black liberation theology is not the gospel at all. It's completely antithetical to scripture. And yet, but like quietly, he'll say, no, just kidding. Well, I've heard that with Moeller. I've heard that with Aiken. I've heard that with other guys, um, Adam Greenway to a degree. Why, why is that? I mean, do you have any like thoughts on like, I mean, are we not Christians? Are we, can we not just say, Hey, I sinned. I messed up. Please forgive me. Well, what's the deal there? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. And, uh, Get into everybody's heart. Tell me their heart. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I did coin a new word a couple of years ago and I said that this disease is rampant in the uh, SBC and um, oh man, now I can't even remember. What's the Greek word for repent? Uh, oh, metanoia. Yeah. Yeah. Metanoia phobia, you know, so it's a fear of repentance. And um, I, I don't know what it is. I mean, it's like a superpower to never have to say you're sorry or something. When, if we get the gospel and the gospel's deep in us and, and you sin, you mess up, man, we have a savior. You don't have to bear that. You don't have to whitewash that or pretend it's less than it is. Just say, yes, I sinned. It was wrong. I've asked God to forgive me. Will you forgive me? And boom, it's over. I mean, we move on. We're all sinners. We're all living by grace. And nobody's pretending that uh, we're above that or that we've never messed up. So I don't know. I mean, I've had private conversations with all the people you've mentioned. And um, uh, I don't know. I'm, you know, they've all done great work in many respects. I've championed every one of them at different times. I've, I've been great cheerleaders uh, for them. And, uh, and yet, you know, I, I, I wish for my leaders right now more leadership. I, I uh, said to more than a couple of them, the SBC needs a leader right now in a desperate way. One of them, one of the SBC leaders said to me, I want to be that. I've described the kind of man we need. And he said, I want to be that man. I said, brother, I think you can be that man. If you will be that man, I will have your back. I will have your back. I will do everything in my power to marshal support for that kind of leadership. And, uh, and yet, as I said to him, but if you do it, you're going to have to break the 11th commandment. You're going to have to be willing to not live by this unwritten commandment that says thou shalt not criticize mm. an SBC entity. So, uh, anyway, I don't know. God yeah. knows. And they will just leave it with him. Yeah. No, praise God. Um, well, I appreciate it. Why don't you, you have anything else you want to add before we before we close out? No. Well, I mean, they, you know, there's a lot. We've talked about problems, and that's what's going on. But again, we praise God for the good things going on. Our culture is on uh, breakneck speed <laughs> road to bad places. Mm-hmm. But what an opportunity for the gospel. What an opportunity for the people of God to stand firm and say, this is what the Lord says. And to preach Jesus Christ. Um, we're doing a Founders Conference in January here in Southwest Florida on the theology of, of man, the anth- biblical anthropology, what is man? We got Paul Washer and Buddy Bauckham uh, coming to uh, preach. It, it'll, it'll be great. We've got other guys as well. So I encourage people to check that out. We started the Institute of Public Theology a couple of years ago because we want to see future generation of men who are going to be leading churches trained in biblical theology that is unafraid to stand in the public square. And uh, just completed a course recently on, on uh, political theology that was dynamite. So I encourage people to check out Institute of Public Theology.org as well. Um, there are efforts underway uh, from people all across the SBC and beyond who are determined to make Christ known. So uh, we just need to rally the troops. The SBC, it's important. It's not all important. So if you're in the SBC, then man, try to make it better. If you're not in the SBC, we'll do the kingdom of God in the work of the kingdom of God in your local arena with as much energy and zeal as you can marshal because it's a needy day, but it is a day fraught with opportunities and we ought to seize them under the Lord's for Christ with, with joy and vigor. Amen. Amen. Uh, and is founders.org. Is that the founders website, right? That's right. Yeah. Founders.org. Okay. Everybody can check out that as well. So, uh, and of course, Institute of Public Theology and all, all the rest. You're on Twitter fairly fairly regularly as well. If anybody wants to drop you a line there, 
Yeah, Tom Askell is the Twitter handle. Right. Okay. Well, I appreciate it, Tom. Thank you again for the time and uh, the conversation and just talking about things that actually matter. Uh, that's really, that's the goal of this channel, this podcast. And I, again, I appreciate the the efforts that you have given here and, and that you've done over the years and continue to do. So anyway, everybody check out Tom's work, founders and, and all the rest. So God bless. Take care. Okay. Thanks, Richard.